Now he is the unit leader for the Kansas Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, and he's going to tell you a little bit about that. But today's topic, besides telling you about the unit, is to talk about prairie chickens, in which we all have an interest. So, Dave Focus. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend a little time talking to you today about uh, some of the activities we've been involved in over the years and what the um, co-op unit is like at, at Kansas State, as well as kind of give you a little insight into some of the, the political and um, <coughs> legislative policy type things that are going on with, with curry chickens. I'm sure all of you have heard a variety of different things regarding um, especially lesser prairie chickens and their upcoming decision about whether or not they're listed as a threatened species underneath the Endangered Species Act and what kind of ramifications that may or may not have. Um, no matter what you hear, nobody really knows. Uh, <coughs> there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, most of it is not nearly as onerous or terrible as some people would like lead you to believe. Um, you can live just fine and dandy with a, a threatened species in the state, even a threatened game species. Um, it's capable of being uh, managed quite well in light of private lands and a variety of other things that are going on. Just to kind of give you a little background about the, uh, the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Units, how many of you have ever heard of the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Units? Okay, um, good. nobody can tell me I'm saying something wrong. But the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Units are our cornerstone of wildlife management and wildlife conservation in the United States. In the United States, we operate under what's called the North American model for wildlife conservation. So in other words, the wildlife belongs to the people. It doesn't belong to the landowner. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you can't buy it, you can't own it, it belongs to the people. And so the North American uh, model uh, heavily incorporates hunting and hunting activities as well as uh, conservation um, for society. So society has inputs into, the, into conservation of, of wildlife and most natural resources in, in the United States relative to, to other countries around the world. Well, the wildlife management and wildlife conservation is a relatively new profession. It really wasn't until the 1930s that wildlife conservation um, got started. Before that, it was primarily in the naturalist realm, or the zoology realm, where kind of a taxonomy thing, where you go out and describe animals, <coughs> kind of compare them, see who is related to whoever, and argue about what their names were and things like that. So starting in the 1930s, um, there was a, 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 a need to do active wildlife management, um, primarily because around the turn of the century, and especially up until the 1930s, wildlife was rapidly disappearing. Bison, elk, turkeys, deer, you name it. We have a lot more now of many species than we did back uh, around the turn of the century. Things were disappearing and people were becoming alarmed. And so there were a few individuals uh, that were very instrumental in wildlife conservation uh, in terms of getting the field started. Uh, Alva Leopold, I'm sure all of you have heard of, you know, basically started the idea of ecology and wildlife conservation and the land ethic and things of that nature starting in the late 1920s, 1930s at, in Madison, Wisconsin, at the University of Wisconsin. And so people started, uh, government started passing laws, started making policy, buying land, and then they realized they had nobody trained to manage those lands or figure out how many birds we could harvest, how many deer we could harvest, what, what's the act, acts necessary to maintain populations of animals at sustainable levels or levels that humans wanted. And so um, a fellow by the name of Dean Garland, who was actually a cartoonist for the Des Moines Register, um, was a major player in the natural resource <laughs> field in terms of messaging and getting these ideas out and, and building consensus and getting partnerships. And he became the, um, the head of the well, predecessor to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service under the Roosevelt administration. And during that time, they, they bought, you know, they, they passed a bunch of laws, primarily the Migratory Bird um, Stamp Act, or Duck Stamp, and started buying a bunch of land. But they didn't have anybody trained. And so Ding Darling came up with the idea of a co-op unit. 
And what a co-op unit is a partnership between the federal government, the state in which the state natural resource and wildlife agency, the university within that state, and the Wildlife Management Institute. The universities in which the co-op units are located are primarily land-grant universities, but not all of them are land-grant universities. They're not primarily <coughs> universities. And so the co-op units basically are staffed by federal scientists. So I work for the I work for the federal government Department of Interior, but we are stationed at universities, <coughs> primarily land-grant universities, but we do research that is highlighted or needed by our cooperators, primarily the state wildlife agency. So it's a, it's a partnership, and it's been going on, and it is, it is one of the found, foundation models for how to do wildlife conservation. The Kansas unit started in 1992, so it's the second newest unit. Uh, Nebraska is the most recent unit that was started. And so we've had a major turnover in the Kansas unit in the last three or four years. We've had all new federal scientists. Uh, we are understaffed, um, but we are functioning at capacity in terms of, of research activities. But the main, the, the, the three main things that a co-op unit does is number one, it does research that is necessary for work. The cooperators, the state and federal agencies that support us. Number two, and we also train graduate students. We do graduate research. Um, and by training graduate students, we're preparing the next generation of biologists, ecologists, wildlife conservation folks, wildlife and fisheries conservation. And number three, we teach classes and do service. Um, so in other words, spread the word. A lot of extension work, um, sit on a lot of committees, <laughs> comment on a lot of things, but in other words, just try to work within those three um, areas of interest. And so when we talk about prairie chickens, obviously prairie chickens is a big issue right now. Uh, and they will be for a long time into the future. Uh, this issue is not going to go away. And so the co-op units are, are very well placed to do research and develop uh, conservation goals and plans relative to prairie chickens. Um, even though they're not they're not a federal trust species at this point in time, they're still the responsibility of the states in which they reside. Um, if the lesser prairie chicken becomes listed as a threatened species, which the decision is sometime in the end of March, if that happens, the lesser prairie chicken becomes a federal trust species. In other words, the responsibility is at the federal level and the state level. But the greater prairie chicken, um, which is this word here, is still a, a state. Um, responsibility. And so these, these birds um, represent a lot of things. Um, they are very unique individuals um, in terms of species, in terms of their requirements, very, very difficult to manage, and bring out a lot of emotion when it comes to people. They are the symbols of the prairie. They are the symbols of westward expansion. They are the symbols of human influence on ecosystems. They are very much um, a, a charismatic species, um, charismatic species. Um, you see them in the springtime, but the rest of the rest of the year they're pretty secretive. You don't know where they are. There's a lot of secrets behind them. No matter how much research we've done on them over the last few years, we still know very little about them. And so what I'd like to do today is spend some time talking about the status of prairie chickens in Kansas. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the ecology or the management. I'm going to talk more about where they are in terms of status and how we monitor these populations and some of the issues and miscommunications that are around that. The biggest um, issues a lot of people have is how you tell them apart. And this is one of the issues that have been going on for many, many years, if not decades or centuries. Because a lot of the early, early accounts, if you go back into the 1800s, nobody can really tell them apart. Or the accounts didn't distinguish between graders and lessers, and sometimes between graders, lessers, and sharp tails, depending on where you were in the prairies. Um, and there's been a lot of range contraction, movement, expansion of these birds in the, over the last 150 years as humans have altered the prairie. Um, and when I talk about the prairie, I mean the entire Great Plains. Um, there are three, basically three or four main ways to tell prairie chickens apart um, from graders, between graders and lessers. 
Number one is the air sac color. Graders have primarily a yellow, yellowish orange. Um, Lesters have a bright, bright orange. Air sac color. Now hybrids have it's a gradation in there, and there are a few hybrids floating around in Kansas. Greater prairie chickens are a little bit bigger. They have longer tail feathers. They have longer wing um, wing feathers and longer pinnae feathers, and uh, they're just bigger all the way around. Habitat is a major way to separate them. Um, as far as I can tell, greater prairie chickens are kind of weenies. They, um, they're not as tough as the lesser. Lessers live out west. Lessers live out where it's dry, hot, cold, windy, snowy, hail, tornadoes, you name it. All, they, that's, where the, that's where the lessers at. The graders are mostly out east in the prairies where it's a little bit more easygoing. Uh, even though the prairie environment is pretty harsh, it can be pretty harsh all the way through the center part of the country, uh, the lessers live in a much more harsh environment. And their populations and their um, <clears throat> history suggests that they are really highly tied to their environment. Um, lessers have a much greater fluctuation in populations over time in terms of going from highs to lows. As a matter of fact, there have been at least three times in the past where people have thought that lessers were going to go extinct. This goes back to the 19-teens, 1940s, 1960s, and now. So there's, there's a lot of concern. Um, lessers are much more restricted in their habitat than graders. And so we'll, we'll kind of go over that more as we go along. And the other way is vocalizations. And vocalizations are, you know, everybody likes to go out and look at Lex. Um, and watch, watch these birds, but if you, if you listen to them and watch how they behave, it's fascinating. You can learn a tremendous amount about almost every type of theory, theoretical aspect of animal behavior by watching prairie chickens. And so, um, I'm going to show a couple of videos here about how um, prairie chickens sound and how they act on the left. And I know many of you have seen at least graders out here on Conja, uh, but you can here we'll give you a, a direct uh, comparison between uh, lessers and graders. This is a grader. more aggressive and a lot more willing to, to fight. 
look at these maps is try to figure out what time scale they're talking about. Because over the last 100, almost 200 years now, prairie chickens, whether they're graders or lessers, have expanded and contracted and moved around quite a bit. Um, now, up here in the, in the northeast part, this is where the heath hen was, which is a tight prairie chicken. That's, that is the original prairie chicken. The greater prairie chicken is actually the heath hen. What we see out here in the middle part of the country is a subspecies of, of, of greater prairie chicken. So the heath hen was first described, um, existed on the coastal barrier islands and coastal shrub country, uh, primarily in New England. The last one died in Martha's Vineyard, uh, actually in a fire, of, I think in the 1920s. Um, but if you go and look at those habitats where those birds are at, they look very similar to where the lesser prairie chickens are found in, in New Mexico, in most shrubby country. You don't, they're, they're not a lot of you know, sand, little bunch of grasses here and there. But the heath hen habitat is very similar to, to lesser prairie chicken. <coughs> And so then in the center part of the country, you got the greater prairie chicken, um, which is, um, again, the, those dots are basically what people consider the historical range. Um, and then down here in the, tech, in the Texas and New Mexico, or Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coast, you have the outwater prairie chicken, which is another subspecies of the greater. And then you have the lessers out here in basically the southwestern southern Great Plains. Now, this is kind of the contemporary um, distribution of graders and lessers in, in the Great Plains, uh, where you basically have most of the greater prairie chickens in the Great Plains are found in Kansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota. You do have a population up here in, in Wisconsin, which is where the Hammerstroms did their work in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, but still kind of hanging on there. They got one preserve where those birds are at. In Minnesota, they had prairie chickens um, basically right um, at the edge of the Red River Valley uh, where on the strip of prairie before you go into forest. Those birds were very um, carefully cultivated and managed 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Now there's a small little hunting season on them through that. And then you've got some scattered prairie chickens in North Dakota. Uh, and then also some graders down in north, northern uh, Oklahoma, um, Oklahoma, primarily in the Tallgrass Prairie Reserve. And then the lessers are basically where the red uh, bars are. Basically, there's an isolated population in uh, eastern New Mexico, west Texas, and then you've got another population in northwest Texas, western Oklahoma, southwestern Kansas, and southeastern Colorado. And where the circle is, is right now the graders and the lessers are overlapping. That's the only place where they overlap in northwest Kansas. Primarily Gold and Logan counties. Um, that's where they overlap. And so you can see that there's a, 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 some major issues just on the surface if the lessers become listed because you have lessers and graders overlapping. Graders obviously have a hunting season in Kansas. Lessers have a hunting season in Kansas. What, what happens when they become, if they become listed, is anybody's guess at this point. Um, but you know, you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of issues out there, and you've got hybridization issues. Are they lessers? Are they graders? And things like that. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that are under consideration. But that overlap um, in northwestern Kansas is a relatively recent event because historically, you don't have to have a little pointer. Denmark. 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 Den uh, current range of, of lesser prairie chickens is relatively recent, like since the mid-1990s. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But this whole area here, there were, there were 
just due to the projector. This whole area that is highlighted here that shows all these counties is what, you, what, what people are calling the historical range of lesser prairie chickens. And again, historical range, you've got to have to figure out what do they mean historical range. Because if you go back before the 1870s, prairie chickens were only basically recorded here and here. There were none in Kansas and Colorado. During the 1870s to the 1920s, when humans started coming in, cultivation, grain started being um, grown, but there's still a lot of prairie left, they started expanding. And during that expansion, there was a lot of dispersal. So you have birds seen, or presumably seen, out in here. Um, but this historical range, most of, most of us consider that a crock of crap. Okay? <laughs> but you'll see it everywhere. Um, and it's basically, it's been repeated so much lately that almost everybody accepts it. I don't. Um, because prairie chickens are never out in here. Lesser prairie chickens. Lesser prairie chickens were never part of short grass prairie. Ever. What they use, this is sand country right in here. That's sandy, that's sandy, that's sandy, this is sandy, this is sandy, that's sandy. So that sand country with the southern Great Plains has much taller grasses, has shrub components to it. Everything else in here, this is all short grass prairie. That's buffalo grass. That's blue grandma, which grows this high when it's wet, this high when it's dry, and it's dry most of the time. And so a prairie chicken stands about this tall. Where are they going to nest? Especially where are they going to nest as six million buffalo go through there in the springtime. Okay, prairie chickens. They may disperse and be seen every now and then, but they disperse and go long, long distances. But in terms of historical range and historical habitat, this and this have always been their core area. This area in here is relatively recent in the last 100 years. This area is, is recent within the last 20 years. So again, from a policy perspective, it's very difficult to, to define. So we, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about lessers. That's what I spent most of my time working on. I'll give you some more greater stuff here in a minute. But we currently think that lessers occur in four different populations, relatively disjunct populations. This down here is the San Shinri Oak habitat, uh, prairies of eastern New Mexico and west Texas. There aren't any prairie chickens from here south, by the way. And this is kind of doesn't exist either. Um, but this is in the, we won't get it. <laughs> okay. um, and then this is the mixed prairie which goes into south central Kansas, um, into northwest Texas. There's, there's some shinnery oak in here. Um, this is uh, the sand sage prairie. And then this is the mixed, this is, this is what they're calling the short grass CRP mosaic. But the CRP is what's providing that taller grass structure that allow those birds to move up here. Because they, they just really don't use the CRP. I mean, use the short grass prairie. And so what, what you'll read nowadays in the literature are the reasons for why they're going to list lesser prairie chickens is since the 1800s, which is, there's been a 97% reduction in population. Again, that's a wild ass guess. Because we don't know what the population was in the 1800s, and it depends on whether it's during a wet year or a dry year. That number actually comes from a publication uh, in 1981 or 82. Um, that was a, in the proceedings of a Forest Service public, uh, no, yeah, Forest Service publication that was never ever peer reviewed. Somebody just pulled that number out of somewhere and it's just been repeated over time. And again, they, they are stating it's 92% reduction in historic range. Well, if you look at where they're currently occupied, that's where they've always been. And then when you throw in this other area of occupied range, as they uh, showed you in the previous slide, they may or may not have been there. So. You know, I don't know if those two things would ever hold up in court. But anyway, the Lesser Prairie Chicken was petitioned for, um, for listing to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 1995. Um, up until a couple of years ago, it was fell, fell underneath this status of warranted but precluded. In other words, it was, uh, the status warranted examination, but it, the actual activity was precluded by other more important and major species activities. Then part of a court settlement at the end of the Bush administration, 
where the Fish and Wildlife Service was required by uh, court proceedings to clear the decks of all the um, proposed listed species. Um, prairie chickens came up where they were proposed to be listed as threatened, and um, that decision would come at the end of March. Okay, <clears throat> so how many prairie chickens are out there? We really don't know. None of these states um, have a very sound prairie chicken monitoring, monitoring, monitoring uh, protocol. Kansas has the longest lasting um, monitoring protocol. Goes back to the early 1960s, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. All the other states are intermittent or very highly localized. So because of the listing issue, um, all the states got together, it's called the, the Interstate Working Group, got together and they hired somebody to do a range-wide survey. And that range-wide survey was done with helicopters in the four different populations in, in, a, in a statistical design using grids. And I'm not going to go into that, how they did it. But the actual 2012 estimate was 3,700 in the San Sidri country, 80, almost about 8,500 in the mixed grass prairie, about 1,300 in the San Sage, and about 23,728 up here where they never used to be. Okay, now, the big problem up here, the one that makes all of us really nervous, is the only reason that the birds are up here is because of CRP, Conservation Reserve Program Land. If the CRP goes away, the chickens ain't going to be there. And they're starting, to, they're starting to go away, as a matter of fact. And so it's right in this area, right in here, where the graders and the lessers actually overlap. And so some of that count might actually be graders. And so you can see that in the traditional area, sand sage, sand shittery, mixed grass, you're looking at about 15,000 birds. No, maybe 12,000 birds, 12 to 15,000 birds. Um, now, historically, if you go back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, this area right in here was the stronghold of the lessers. So they said, okay, now we need to do this survey again. So they did it again in 2013. And that's 2013 estimate. 17,616. 53% decline. That's why it's going to be probably more than likely listed as endangered species. If that population hasn't gone down that much, they, will, they will, it probably wouldn't be listed. The bad part about it, the bad thing about it, is 2014 estimate is going to be lower yet. Primarily because in 2011, there's a huge drought right in here. 2012, this whole area is a huge drought. So in the 2013 breeding season, there was no habitat, no cover anywhere. So there was no recruitment. Now, there was rain latter part of last summer in 2013, which hopefully will have some good nesting cover throughout most of this area, but the survey takes place before the nesting happens. So that number is going to actually go down. Now, if you take the number in 2012, some folks have I have done this, they've recreated the, the numbers in the past. And so this is the San Shinri Oak habitat of eastern New Mexico and West Texas, going back to the mid-1960s. And you can see that there was a blip in here during the mid-1980s, which is actually when I did my work out there. Um, back then, we had one bird for every five acres of habitat. Now you're talking two or three birds per square mile in some of this habitat. So in 2013, there's basically, two, they estimate 2,000 birds in that whole area, which is way down from about 15,000 estimated back then. Now this is just a retrospective reconstruction on very minimal data, so don't put a lot of faith in it. But if you look again, here's the San Sagebrush. Remember I told you the San Sagebrush used to be the big stronghold back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And again, that number has declined almost to zero since then, but it was a huge number up in the 100,000 range back, back then. And you can, again, you can see these numbers were really low in the 1960s. And again, that's typical of uh, lesser prairie chickens. We have these big dips, um, periodicities in their 
and their population status, and people were actually thought in the 1967 68 there's publications saying lesser prairie chickens were going extinct. And again, same thing happened. This is the mixed grass prairie. And you can see the mixed grass prairie, you can start to see these periodicities. You know, they, the birds have lows and they have highs, and they have lows and they have highs. So the periodicities for lessers are very common and, and natural. <coughs> Uh, the, the key is, is that when the environmental conditions are correct, there's enough habitat left for these birds to bounce back up. Um, and then again, in 2013, you're looking at a reduction. It's back in the mid, early 1980s and 70s, you know, almost 100,000 birds to what we have right now. And then in the shark grass prairie, nobody even started counting them until year 2000. And they steadily increased, probably because we got better and better at counting them. And then they had a big decrease. And that decrease has actually gone down even further. Should be, yeah, should be right down in here right now. This is 2013. And a little bit of the Osage area. Um, so this blue line is where the, <coughs> where the greater prairie chickens are. And then you have the, the area of overlap is right in there. The red line is where the lesser prairie chickens are. And so these. These gray bars, these are survey routes that have been uh, conducted by Kansas Wildlife Parks and Tourism since the early 1960s. The numbers have actually increased over time. But if you look, there's, they estimate that there's 23 million acres of greater prairie chicken range and a little over 9 million acres of lesser prairie chicken range in Kansas. And so, this trend is only for the last three years because there's 31 survey routes that's only been in the last three years that all 31 have run. And so this is the recent three-year trend for greater prairie chickens in Kansas. I'll show you the, the regional trends here in just a second. And the greater prairie chickens are, are going down. Again, yeah, a lot of this is probably drought related more than anything else. You really can't make any kind of of uh, conclusions based on such a short time series for when all the um, survey routes are ran. But in the Flint Hills, and this number over here is the number of birds per square mile, by the way. And so in the Flint Hills, there's nine survey routes. You go back to the late 1970s, and you basically had about a 50% drop in prairie chickens. So this is, don't think of this as a literal number, think of it as more of an index to the population. So whatever the numbers were back in the 1970s, we got about half of them now in the Flint Hills when it comes to greater prairie chickens. In the Osage area, it's even worse. We got about a third uh, of the birds that we had back in the, in the 1960s and 1970s. In those areas where the, um, the Birds, lessers and prairie, lessers and graders overlap in the northern high plains. You really only have one survey route in there. It's only been ran or conducted since 2004. You have a long-term increase, but a short-term decrease. And again, the <coughs> decrease is about a 50% drop in the last two or three years. And this is this is actually represents the 2013 value. And then the Smoky Hills, where you have both birds. Of both species um, since the since basically I, don't, I ignore that 86 number uh, but basically since the uh, mid 1990s you've had ups and downs but it's a relatively stable population but you've had a couple of years of uh, declines um, because when you do the certain when you do these surveys you can't distinguish between graders and lessers when you're doing the counts um, they, they flush the birds up and you just count them as they go so you can't really distinguish whether the graders are causing the decline or the lessers are now, statewide for lessers, they've got 14 routes that they currently run for lessers, and all 14 have been conducted since 2004. And you're, you're looking at, you know, six birds per square mile uh, back in 2005, 2006, down to a little over one, 1.7 right now. And so it's, it's a major, major decline in lessers. And from a regional perspective. Um, the Central High Plains, <coughs> South Central High Plains, which is basically, you know, the Red Hills area. You had a big increase uh, about 10 years ago. It's been declining ever since. 
Um, the Southern High Plains, the uh, basically, which is the, um, the Santa Sage Prairie, we had, again, an increase in the late 90s and then a decrease ever since. Um, again, with a peak back in the 1980s. <coughs> and um, these trends are causing a lot of issues. And so the issues primarily are related to a scale that we're not used to working with from a wildlife conservation perspective. It's a very difficult thing to try to manage for prairie chickens. They need huge areas. It's not like managing for quail or pheasants where you can manage in 40 or 60 or 100 acre blocks. Prairie chickens, you need to manage, and, and these again are just wild guesses, somewhere around the 20,000 to 35,000 acre range in order to have a sustainable population. And they still, there's a lot of debate about what that number actually is. And so there's a lot of threats to prairie chickens. The biggest threat is con conversion of native prairie. And that underlies all these other threats. Now, there, yes, there was an increase in lesser uh, chickens when some of that native prairie was plowed up and put into grains back around you know 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. And so that artificially increased the uh, population visit eliminated one of their limiting factors, which was winter food. The primary, there are two primary limiter, limiting factors for lesser prairie chickens, winter food and nesting cover. And so when you eliminate one of them, the population obviously expands. But as you eliminate more and more native prairie, or degrade more and more native prairie uh, through one way or another, then these, then these limiting factors again start to take hold, and the prairie capacity is declined, <laughs> And you start to see the birds decline into what can be supported by the remaining habitat. But if you're talking, again, you saw in Kansas, 9 million acres of lesser prairie chicken range, basically supporting roughly 14 or 15,000 prairie chickens. That's a lot of country that has to be managed. And we're not capable of managing at that scale. So it's very, very difficult to. Um, develop a conservation plan. The, con uh, uh, the conversion of native prairie is the underlying threat to prairie chickens. And with the commodity prices, energy production, um, energy exploration, biofuels, things like that, all of that is converting the prairie. On top of the, the conversion of native prairie, you have fragmentation and, and, and degrading of the remaining grasslands. So if you go out west, even now in the sand country, you start to see this patchwork of, of land cover, where you have small little patches of prairie, uh, then you've got some other kind of land use. Um, and even CRP is not good at some, in some points. And so there's a, a patchwork out there, and prairie chickens do not do well in patchwork landscapes. They've got to have big, contiguous blocks. And how do you address that? We really don't know. Then you have woody encroachment. You have invasive woody trees, primarily due to the lack of fire. This is, pro this is principally in the Red Hills of Kansas and Oklahoma, where you've got um, sufficient precipitation to have fuel loads and have more uh, frequent enough burning uh, to prevent these eastern and west cedars from going in. The eastern and west cedar invasion on the eastern part of the lesser range is a, is a huge problem. Unmanaged grazing is a huge problem, especially during drought years. Um, and, and there's a whole lot of social and economic reasons for that. But unmanaged grazing, especially out west in the sand country, if you have, if you have unmanaged grazing, you've got big um, invasion, I shouldn't say, a release, a development of shrubs. And some shrubs are very, very important for lesser prairie chickens, sand chicken, oak, and sand sage. But too much is also bad. And so there's a lot of emphasis right now in developing grazing systems. Um, energy development. Um, prairie chickens do not like tall things in the prairie. Um, there's some debate on what the actual impact is, whether it's a direct impact or an indirect impact. Um, that's still being debated. But energy development, whether it's oil and gas, wind, biofuels, solar, you name it, it all has an impact. And then climate change seems to be causing these periodicities 
to fall apart in terms of the regularity. So in other words, climate change is kind of interrupting the natural uh, fluctuations in the population. So the Interstate Working Group got together and they put together these, these goals. Um, basically, in order for them to consider having a sustainable population of prairie chickens, each one of those ecoregions, the San Shinri <coughs> Prairie, the San Sage Prairie, the Mixed Grass Prairie, Shortgrass CRP, they want to have at least this many birds, and they want to have them in the next 10 years. Um, this is what they're proposing to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to help prevent the listing from occurring. So in other words, they want to have a total of 60,000, 67,000 birds, which is basically an increase of 50,000 from where it is now. That's way down from the historical numbers, which is what's causing the Fish and Wildlife Service heartache right now. And it's a lot of dependence where almost half of it is basically in an area that's only recently been um, invaded or adapted to by, by lessers. So, what the biologists have come together and said basically they've, they've looked at the prairie chicken range and they've looked at these areas and said, okay, where do we need to concentrate? And so they've tiered. Uh, the areas or the habitats in which they want to do um, priority conservation. So the green areas are where these prairie chickens are have what they call are, what they're calling strongholds. They want to keep them there. That's going to be the core populations or the source populations. In Colorado, is it this area right up here, um, <coughs> Comanche County, I think. Um, Comanche, and this is Kiowa. This is a sand sage prairie that's really kind of unique and it's stuck between two rivers. But most of their Colorado birds, which is roughly 900,000, most of them are up here. So they want to keep that area. And this is actually a 40,000 acre ranch that is leased by um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Then they've got this area down in here in Powers County, which is kind of a CRP grassland. Um, as a stronghold. Then you've got up here, this is Smoky Valley Ranch area in Logan and Gold counties. Um, there's more bird lessons over here than there are over here. And then in Oklahoma, you've got um, Harper County, Beaver County. There aren't any chickens here yet. I don't know why they picked that, but anyway. Um, and then they've also got focal areas. These are the areas where they want to <coughs> do conservation in order, in order to bring the birds back up and then connect these areas through <coughs> what they call a connectivity zone. So that's for the three northern populations, the southwest population, all in New Mexico, right here in terms of where they want to have their strongholds. And so what they're proposing to the Fish and Wildlife Service is working in these green areas and then connecting the green areas through some sort of habitat management. <coughs> what a lot of people think is that the, the agencies or the biologists are trying to have contiguous habitat from here to here, for example, or from here to here or here to here, but prairie chickens can fly. So we don't have to have contiguous habitat, we just got to have patches of habitat between the focal areas where the birds can go in order to, to get from one side to another. Now the big problem with lessers and the big problem with most prairie chickens is they have a lecking mating system like we saw earlier on and so a dispersal of one or two individuals is not going to create a sustainable population. You have to have, the you have, to have big numbers of birds move in order to create that breeding system in order to have a sustainable population. And so in the San Chase Prairie of southern, southwestern Kansas, southeastern Colorado, you're looking at Comanche and uh, Comanche and Cimarron National Grasslands, and then this stuff right up in here, um, over just a little bit east of, or west of Garden City in the San Sage Prairie, is where they're going to concentrate working in Kansas on the, in the San Sage. And the mixed grass, this is the Red Hills of Kansas right here. This is a huge area, this is where we're doing a lot of work right now. Um, that's far we're going, I think. This is, yeah, that's a half knife branch, I can't remember what color it is. Kiowa, I think. Comanche. Comanche? I always get Kiowa and the Comanches. Kiowa is just east of Comanche. Okay. That's Comanche. That's Comanche. <coughs> okay. Comanche County. 
Then it goes into the sec the, the one over just uh, east of that one is going to That's Comanche. The farthest the one east, I think. Okay. Never both. <laughs> yeah, they're all they're all square. They all kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you generally got the idea where it's at. And then they've got some of these areas down here. There have been cherry chickens down here in Texas, hundred years. I don't know what it is, but yeah, I guess that's what a lot of it's called. And then um, the short grass prairie. Um, that's that's gold. That's Logan. That's Gold County. And so there's a big big area down in here. This is all these areas where they want to concentrate. So if anybody, if you have land or if you know of anybody that has land in these local areas in Kansas, there's an ungodly amount of money available to landowners right now to do things for prairie chickens. And they're looking for people to sign up. So the future for prairie chickens is kind of uncertain. Um, humans are kind of getting into the prairie chicken world a little bit late. Um, we don't really understand it, so we're making decisions on very limited information. Even though research has been going on for quite a while, there's still a lot of missing information. And so the research that we do is kind of lagging behind landscape changes. Because landscape changes are taking place very quickly out there. Climate change is having a big impact, not only on prairie chicken breeding, but also on the foods that they need. Uh, we don't understand much about that. And the populations are declining in the short term. Those of us that, that really consider prairie chicken populations in terms of the long term don't see the current decline um, in as fearful as tones as some people do. Um, but then we're not the ones making decisions and, and struggling with courts and a variety of other things that are going on. So uh, the future is. I think the, probably the best that is coming out of this work with, with prairie chickens right now is the fact that they're getting a lot of attention. Nobody paid much, you know, really paid much attention to them before. Um, and the needs of these, of these unique birds and the importance of these unique birds. Um, that is the number one most important thing. Um, and then the, as long as the, the threat of additional regulations and the threat of, of closing down hunting seasons and things like that, are present, then act conservation activities will be a priority for these for these species, and hopefully, in the long term, it will benefit. Um, but again, these birds have been around for a long time; they've gone through a lot of different things. Um, so, the, the future is, is really unknown. And um, with that, I'll kind of turn it over to the more exciting things this morning. <laughs> After you ask any questions that you may have. <laughs> I'd like to reiterate a story when I was a teenager in junior high. This gentleman, this is Northwest Kansas, Rolland in Thomas County. We used to go coon hunting at night. We used to get, we had a big place up on the Sapa Creek. And he'd tell how when he was a kid, he was 75, this is the early 50s, they would start at his place and it was about 25, 28 miles to Colby to the railroad and they would shoot prey chickens. Wagon load or so of prey chickens, this is a market hunter time, and put them on the railroad, they'd sold them, and send them back east. And this is Rollins and Thomas County. And then I'd like to make a couple comments about ethanol industry is hurting you big time, really big time. And the, you talk about the, the old shittery country. Not only were prairie chickens big in those times, the Native Americans loved that area because it was so diverse. And now we've got the Cooper's hawk. We can't do anything about raptors, and they're really, really hard on <coughs> birds that size. And something else that most people don't notice, I grew up in western Kansas. When I grew up in there in the 50s and early 60s, we didn't have hardly any kit foxes. We have coyotes, red foxes, and now there's probably more kit foxes than anything else, and they are death on birds. A couple, a couple of comments on that. Number one, um, the market hunting stuff. You're entirely right. Around the turn of the 1890s, turn of the century, mark, you know there was a lot of per, the prairie chickens were lessers and graders were very commonly found in that part of the world. I mean, there's a lot of lessers records from Nebraska. The way that the lesser 
Prairie Chicken was originally identified was a naturalist going through the game market in New York City. <laughs> said, this one looks different from that one. <laughs> and, and that's how they that's how they initially basically, you know, there was a few, you know, a few naturalists and early explorers that knew that they were different, but that's how it got out to the public. And, uh, in terms of your question about San Shinri country and why Native Americans liked it, that's where the that's a reliable water was. Oh yes. That's where Close the spring surface. Oh, yeah. Yes. And that's why the prairie chickens did very well in those things. Uh, those springs are gone. Um, so it's, it's uh, quite interesting. And uh, in terms of swift fox, yeah, we had quite a few swift fox kill our transmitter birds last spring because <clears throat> we'd always find their transmitters in their burrows. And what's really interesting is I had, we put out a bunch of satellite transmitters on, on prairie chickens. And those satellite transmitters have activity sensors on them that basically tell me when the bird has stopped moving or what we consider it to die. And so we'd have these birds that would all of a sudden, it looked like they were dead, and then they'd come back to life. And they'd be dead for a while and come back to life. <laughs> and one of my technicians figured out what the problem was, is that the swift fox would take the dead bird back to the den, and then the kit, the, the young swift fox, would take the transmitters and play with them. <laughs> <laughs> and so then the, the bird, you know, according to the satellite, or the transmitter, everything came back to life. And so, so we'd have all these locations right around this swift fox hole. I said, okay, it's in there. <laughs> you know, so that yeah, there, there, there's a lot of different, a lot of neat things, a lot of changes going on that we don't understand. Yes, sir. Good questions. The basic question is, how do we name greater and lesser? About. And number two, with your uh, chicks there, are the number of chicks per hatching increasing or decreasing? We don't know. And to answer your second question, we don't know. Um, <coughs> nest success is actually pretty good, and they usually have, the, we, in terms of lessers, there's not very many data, there's not much data out there in nests. Um, but what I can see is probably the number of birds that hatch in a successful nest is really unchanged. It's about 9 to 11. Um, the survival of those chicks is, is determined by the environmental conditions. And so if you have a late hatch like we did this or in 2013 where the birds hatch really late in that hot, dry times, a lot of them just die from exposure. So we want as early spring as possible. You get an early spring, with the residual grasses, you can have a lot of prairie chickens the next year. In terms of lessers and graders, um, <coughs> the taxonomy behind <coughs> prairie chickens and prairie grouse is very cumbersome to try to understand. Because for a long time, they were considered, lessers were considered subspecies of graders. Uh, and the graders were initially described in the 1810, 1820. Um, the heath ham. And so it was called, a, at that time, called a grater. But there, were, there have been times where sharp tails, lessers, and graters were all together in the same genus. And then, the, then lessers have been subspecies under graters. And then they were actually, at some point, there were separate genuses. It's, it's just a mess. And so the, the ALU checklist, I think, in 1930s is the one that basically set it up as lessers and graters. <coughs> Yes. How is uh, prairie fires related to those? Prairie fires? Yes. Are they good form, bad form? How do we deal with them? Depends on who you talk to. <laughs> if you burn an entire area, it's bad. Because they need that residual nesting cover. If it's patchy burning, if it's patchy burning, essentially from, from graders, there was just a, a, a study just finished up south of here, down by Council Grove and farther south, um, on graders in a patch burn management scenario where chunks of the patch were, you know, the three-year rotation, and the birds nested in the two and three-year-old pastures. Um, they never, you know, they never really went into the currently burned pastures. So if you burn the whole area, it's bad. Um, but if you burn parts of it, it's good because it rejuvenates it. For lessers, it's a the, it's a little more it's a little bit more mixed because on the, on the eastern side of the range, burning's good because it holds <coughs> the woody cover. 
On the western side, if you burn at the wrong time of the year, um, or burn under the wrong conditions, it could be four or five years before anything ever grows there again. So, it, you know, and the shrubs are quite adapt to fire, they'll, they can take out, especially stand sage, they can take out. Yes? Is there any evolutionary trend toward either hybridization or further separation? Well, they, the hybrid, they, they, they successfully interbreed between graders and lessers. We have caught youngsters. We don't know if youngsters are fertile or not. Um, but if you go back into like 1860s and 1870s, in Kansas, Colorado, and Nebraska, there were sage grouse, greater prairie chicken, sharp tails, and lessers all together. And they're all still considered separate species, but that's you know, 150 years ago. Um, so from an evolutionary perspective, I really couldn't tell you. What effect does the pheasant population have on the prairie chicken? None. No, the what population? Thank you. Back there? Yeah, I was going to say, and I've been a dozen for 13 years, and I've done the prairie chicken tours out here for 12. And when I first started doing the tours, there were at least four lakhs on the Kanza Prairie. The main one that they did research off of had between 20 and 25 males and up to 10 females come in. Well, at present time, we're down to one lack, if you want to call it that, and we've got maybe seven males and six females that are coming in. Um, at that same time frame, in those 13, 12 years, there was two research done with the prairie chicken, five years and two years, uh, where they were live captured, messed with, uh, banded, painted their butts, all this type of thing, so they could keep track of them. Handling that much, would that affect them leaving a certain 8,600 acres and go someplace else? I don't think so. Um, geez, we, you know, I've caught a lot of birds <laughs> on the same left year after year after year, three or four or five years in a row. And, uh, well, I know that when I first started, it was an area where the cattle were grazing and the grass was short all the time. Well, they quit grazing the cattle there for comparison with the bison and everything. The chickens moved. Yep. And because the grass was five foot tall, yep. <laughs> for one reason, then they went into the fire lanes to do their, their dancing. Uh, but now we're down to one lack of possibly one or two birds here or there. You yeah. know. Changes in habitat are, are much more likely to make a move. Now, the thing about lex, <coughs> and I'm, I'm going to I'm going to add to one more question and then wrap this up. But the thing about lex is when a lek disappears, it's probably because of something that happened several years in the past. Because those males are tied to that lek, and they'll be there, especially the dominant males, and males that are established territory, they'll be there until they die. So you can have a lek exist, but have no influence on a population in terms of breeding. The females don't visit, but those, those males will come back and back and back until they all die out. Which is why sometimes when like wind farms go up, leks will be there for like three or four years, and then they'll go away. But the females probably won't come there, it's just that the males are tied to that lek. And so, but then those, new, those leks that are established when the birds move, if it's longer than just a few hundred yards, are probably young birds or dispersing birds or uh, you know just different groups of, different groups of birds. Now, yes, they will disperse. Uh, a lek will move in a general area from one year to another all the time, especially for for graders. Not as much for lessers. Yeah. Well, because of their breeding habits, I was wondering if there's a possibility to uh, capture breed and lose them. Not, not, not prairie chickens. We've tried that with the outwaters since the early, since the late 1970s. And we still only have like 10 outwater prairie chickens in the wild. They, they, they do not do well in captivity. It's not like pheasants or quail or something. There's a lot of people that are supposed to do it right now, but it's, they get disease, they don't act right, they, they die, they just don't do well. Okay.
Thank you.